We now have uh, the pleasure to, in to introduce Jonathan de la Field. Donat Jonathan is a professor at Start Clyde in uh, Glasgow uh, University. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk about intentionality. Jonathan uh, does a broad range of work uh, fr from neonates to children of school age and leverages technology in, in all these uh, areas. So we, we look forward to your talk. <laughs> so where's the talk? We can survive without it. Without the audio. But I still need, I'm going to try to Okay, we'll do it after. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Liz, for inviting me to, um, to this excellent uh, group, which is really um, important to catalyze uh, change in thinking about, uh, about autism how we might um, assess children um, to determine whether they have autistic characteristics or not, um, and indeed uh, the, the, the treatment piece. Um, I came from a conference a couple of weeks ago uh, from the uh, Gilbert Neuropsychiatry Center, and just as a, a comment to echo um, Eric London's talk, uh, they practice a model um, of psychiatric evaluation called ESSENCE. Um, it's a very complex acronym, uh, which stands for Early Symptomatic Syndromes Eliciting Neuro neuropsychiatric clinical evaluation. Um, so the essence of a neurodevelopmental uh, condition. And the purpose of that, because they're neuropsychiatric clinically led, um, is simply to see the child um, as the whole child, um, regardless of its um, complex, um, its complex symptomatology. Um, and it avoids pigeonholing children into autism or DCD or dyspraxia, which, which, whatever particular feature might be the most prominent and therefore the primary diagnosis. So there is a lot of work um, going on to try to remove those pigeonholes. So um, I'm, I'm very impressed with their system. Uh, I want to talk to you today about some uh, of, of uh, the developmental psychology be behind child development, because I think we need a rethink in terms of how we view the developing mind. So I'm a developmental scientist. Um, I started um, my academic career with uh, molecules, looking at, at the at chemistry and medicinal chemistry. Um, moved into neuroscience and developmental neuroscience to look at brain development uh, as an extension to that um, into the developmental psychology of basic mental experience, uh, minimal mental experience, minimal consciousness, shall we say. Um, and I think it's important to recognize its, um, its substrate, um, its uh, organic form, as it were, and how that empowers and structures agency uh, and intentionality in the world from a very early age. Um, so that we can understand the role of movement in autism uh, and the role of disruption or a, uh, a, a, um, a thwarting of intentionality uh, in autistic movement um, as, a, as a baseline, a developmental baseline for understanding how the more f uh, full and comprehensive autistic symptomatology might develop. So I'm going to introduce this term, the core self. Um, it has a few uh, antecedents, um, especially Winnicott. Um, looked at the core self, uh, and but especially Yuck Pangsep, um, the father of affective neuroscience, who identified what he called the core self, and he would capitalize S-E-L-F uh, as simple egotype life form, because he was interested in, as a comparative uh, neuroscientist in what, what common features um, were, were there at present in mammals and other vertebrates um, that generated uh, affective evaluations and intentional engagements with the environment. 
So just to begin, um, there are two forms of cognition that we have to recognize. Um, this is uh, from Jerome Bruner, the father of uh, cognitive science, um, who responded in the 1960s uh, to behaviorism as a black box approach being unsatisfactory for understanding psychology, um, and developed uh, the cognitive model, which we're now, uh, for better or worse, um, we're stuck with uh, in terms of a, a, a psychological model of how thought and the mind function. But he made the point very early on that in fact cognition can be divided into two classes or two types of cognition. Uh, on the one hand, there's a narrative mode of cognition. Uh, the narrative mode um, is what Margaret Donaldson, the, the uh, child psychologist, would call the line mode of thought. It proceeds through time, it has temporal dimension, it's embodied in lived experience. Um, so it's, uh, it proceeds through time in interaction with the world. Um, and it's always colored with vital affectivity. It's always appraising the environment for benefit uh, or threat. Um, in, in opposition to this, or in contrast, is the logic of scientific mode of cognition, which is our abstract conceptual mode of thought, which is disembodied and held in timeless uh, abstract space, which allows us to understand the lawful relations of the different parts and different parts of experiences and conceptualize those uh, into organizations that allow for uh, intellectual planning, offline planning, um, concepts, and uh, and so forth. But this logical scientific mode uh, of, of cognition is always informed by the narrative mode because we live life through experience. Uh, and this is why uh, even uh, lawyers will tell stories about why a particular thing happened. Uh, and indeed, even physicists or mathematicians will tell stories about how uh, the logic of mathematics uh, fits together to produce a certain result. Uh, or in physics, how certain components um, are, are fitting to, fitted together to produce certain uh, organizations. So this narrative mode underpins uh, our logical scientific mode. But once we've captured those experiences, held them in memory, uh, and able to reflect upon them in an abstract sense, we can then form this logical scientific mode of cognition, which feeds back necessarily uh, into the narrative mode of cognition, right? Um, because we have to retell those we have to retell that knowledge through time through stories uh, and this is the power of uh, of narrative so where does this early meaning making come from um, let's look at the early origins of shared meaning and their emotional em and embodied characteristics their emotional embodied foundation well one of the first uh, organizations of a uh, human life uh, is through the organization of movement um, and this is uh, Roger Sperry. He, run, he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in the 1980s uh, for his work on the split brain, uh, for, on the split brain consciousness, effectively. So they cut, cut the corpus callosum uh, of the cerebral cortex uh, and recognized that the two cerebral hemispheres um, were able to hold separate knowledge, uh, separate uh, bases of knowledge, which then um, I think my I think my um, PowerPoint is a bit off. So excuse me. Let me just adjust this. Uh, which held uh, different um, isolated bases of knowledge, but were integrated uh, through the brainstem, which was able to carry out the action of communicating that knowledge. Right? There's nothing that the brain does which, which um, is not communicated through movement, if I have those words correct. So everything that we know, feel, think, and experience is shared uh, through motor action. Right? Even the, the, the complex articulation of speech uh, is a motor action. Uh, it's happening at a sub-second, millisecond by millisecond level, uh, but it's, co it's coordinating uh, both the intra-body coordination of, of musculature, the thorax, the diaphragm, the vocal articulators, the oral cavities, the tongue, of course, to produce very complex sequences of sounds, of muscle movements which are producing sounds, to communicate something that's held in my mind, so I can share that uh, with you. So motor coordination is the sole product of brain function. So... Let's look at two principles of psychology, right? The first one is, I like to move it. We're animated beings. We're living animals um, that move with our own purpose, our own sense of uh, uh, intention, uh, and the feelings that, um, that power or structure and drive those. Um, there's a basic inherent satisfaction in acquiring successful motor acts, goals, even gesticulating like this. If I do it successfully, it generates a baseline, a basic sense of satisfaction because I've created that purposefully, successfully. Uh, the second principle is I like to move with you. 
Um, we are obligatorily gregarious, as Heidegger reminds us. We are, we are a hyper-social species, and we are required to move with each other. Um, we are driven to move with each other and to communicate um, our sense of the world with other people. So this gives meaning-making and social understanding in intersubjective engagement. It's two subjectivities coming together uh, to form a coherent shared understanding of the particular situation. Uh, with slightly more technical language, we, we know that movements are self-generated. They're not mindless reflex actions, but they're generated by the agent. So they're self-generated, they're affective, affectively driven, um, typically to achieve satisfaction and to avoid dissatisfaction. They're prospective because they're acting ahead in time, uh, and they're therefore intentional acts, and I'll qualify this as we move on. So they're made in concert and coordinated interpersonal sensory motor action, actions together. For example, dancing uh, with a partner or in speech uh, and performing uh, elaborate complex social rituals such as coming together in a conference. We coordinate our timing, hopefully, uh, and the different actions uh, of each other so that we can come together as a cohesive group uh, and generate shared meaning together. So this is the, the, the essence of shared intersubjective meaning. Okay, let's go back uh, to this idea of mind in movement uh, and what, um, what we are taught uh, about uh, the, the role of movement in mind. Uh, actions are not mindless reflexes, as I've stated, but they're prospective. Now, in the motor control field, um, motor control scientists will tell you, yes, these are prospectively organized. They're organized with a view to the future. Um, but they are, a, they are careful uh, not to say that they're intentional. Uh, however, I did some work uh, with Nivedita Gangopadhyay, uh, a, a talented philosopher from Dan Zahavi's Center for Subjectivity in Copenhagen, and they take a phenomenological approach to this. Um, and we reason that these, the prospectivity in an action, um, the idea is heading towards a future, um, is akin to what we might call intentionality, or what Franz Brentano uh, identified as the core aspect uh, of mental experience. Now, he resurrected or, or reinvigorated this idea of intentionality uh, as being the, the basic structure uh, of what is mind. Right? You can strip away memories and, uh, and concepts and higher order cognitions, but you're left with something um, as, as a tension between the present moment and the imminent future directed by that intentionality. Uh, he says every mental phenomena includes something as object within itself. That object is that imminent objectivity. So we reason this something as object is born of the necessity of prospective motor control. The idea that the animal is moving into the future and needs to know ahead of time um, what that future is to structure the desired future and avoid the unwanted future. Every action presumes a motor sensory contingency. Yeah, so it, movements generate the sensory uh, stimulations that the mind that receives as a consequence. So the psychology will typically say, well, look, we have a stimulus response paradigm. We want to look at the, uh, the, the workings of the mind and we'll, we'll produce a stimulus, a bright light or a, a nice shiny apple and see how the mind responds. It treats the mind as a passive reactive uh, event rather than an active self-generating event moving itself into the future. So we we're interested in this notion of, uh, of, of prospective control as being a sign uh, evidence of intentionality, intentionality of a very basic kind. Let's look at this newborn infant. This is a, a baby that's one and a half days old. Um, we're videoing now from the uh, from an eagle's eye view. This is in the neonatal unit uh, of the hospital uh, at Edinburgh. And you can see that actions of the baby appear to be coordinated, coherent, made with some affective sense of uh, of the world around the baby and its internal, uh, its internal state. The digits are very coordinated. The arms are moving somewhat in concert with the father's hand that's, that's rubbing the chest. Uh, and it's expressing something of the internal state of the, uh, of, of the baby. Um, now, pediatric textbooks would suggest that these, that these movements are mere non-mental reflexes. Yeah? So old, um, uh, very old evolutionary inheritance um, that Act in the act as a response to sensory stimulation, but that's not the way that these movements uh, are, and it's not the way that, that we see these movements. We see these, these movements as being self-generated um, actions created by the infant. 
So the question was, well, are these movements prospectively organized? Are they organized with a sense of where they're going ahead in time? Um, we used a theory of, um, of prospective motor control from David Lee, uh, so David Lee, the General Tao theory. Um, and we analyzed the movements, looking at the, uh, the displacement of the movements along the vertebral axis and compared it to the mathematical model uh, here. Um, the take home message was that 78% of the movements were prospectively organized. They were organized ahead of time according to this particular theory of prospective control. That gave us reason to support the idea that these are intentionally driven movements. They're movements with, a, with an idea of that future, uh, that imminent future. Uh, interestingly as well, um, subtly but significantly, there was a reduction in, in the degree of control in infants that were born prematurely and therefore at risk for neurodevelopmental disorder. So this tells us two things. First of all, that there's a primary sensory motor intentionality. Now we're qualifying this to remove it from the, the adult reflective conceptually backed form of intentionality that we typically think of as intentionality. Um, to, to recognize that there's something inherent in the movements that are themselves intentional, but they're pre-reflective, they're pre-conceptual, but they're nevertheless future-oriented, simple, but smart, right? So the next question was, well, where do these come from? Because the baby doesn't arise simply uh, uh, at nine months gestation and, uh, and, and appear, but it goes through, uh, obviously, three trimesters of, of gestational development. Um, this is a 16-week gestational age fetus. You can see the, uh, the cranium here. This is the, um, the spine, the vertebral column. You see the digits of the hand. This is the, the placental lining. And you can see, even at this very early age, the first part of the second trimester, the fetus is moving in a coordinated fashion. These don't appear to be reflex actions elicited by a stimulation or, or even set patterns of reflex actions uh, that are endogenous, endogenously generated. Um, but it, it appears from a qualitative point of view, a, a subjective point of view, that they are guided with some sense of where they're going. There's some sense of coherence. Now, this is um, work that other labs picked up. Um, it, it, very importantly, the first signs of that self-generated action uh, occurs at between eight and 10 weeks gestational age. That's the first age that the, that the fetus is, um, is generating its own body movements. Um, in fact, that's been pinpointed to seven weeks uh, and, and six days uh, gestational age. Um, but by 14 weeks gestational age, these movements are being directed um, differentially to the different aspects of its environment. In the case of twin pregnancies, uh, a twin will reach to touch the other twin with the same action pattern as it will reach to touch its own face, for example. But that action pattern is different from the actions that it uses to reach to touch uh, the umbilical cord or the placental lining. In other words, the, the, the motor sensory contingency is recognized by 14, just 14 weeks gestational age to recognize an animate object in its environment, self or twin other, that's different from the inanimate objects, the placental lining or the umbilical cord. And that's at 14 weeks gestational age. Um, we know from the same group that about 18 to 22 weeks, in the case of singleton uh, pregnancies, they can isolate what they call action planning. Again, it's another form of prospective control. Before the movement initiates, there's a sense of the sensory consequences that will ensue from that particular movement. Um, and we know from other, uh, uh, a number of other studies, uh, Miyawa Yamakoshi, for example, looks at the way that the thumb or, the, or the, the digits of the hand are brought to the mouth, and the mouth opens in anticipation. Now, this is an intra-body uh, motor sensory contingency in anticipation of the thumb reaching the mouth. There's an awareness of where the future is, is uh, an awareness of what the future uh, will be like because that future is self-generated by the particular agent, in this case, uh, a very young fetus. Uh, and Alessandro Piantelli has done beautiful work um, characterizing these and mapping uh, the self-generated actions of the fetus from very early stages uh, through to postnatal uh, post development. So what's very interesting about this is that at 14 and 18 weeks gestational age, uh, there's no cerebral cortical connectivity to speak of. The, the, the cortex, which uh, cognitive neuroscience focuses almost all of its attention upon, um, is for all intents and purposes not developed and offline. Um, there's no thalamocortical connectivity, and in fact the cortical laminate, laminate, lamination itself uh, has, has not uh, fully formed. So these self-generated prospective acts, these in 
primary intentional acts of the fetus um, are generated by subcortical structures, brainstem structures, which are mature because they're onto genetically prior, and they're connected to the skeletal musculature to control those particular activities. So this, uh, this reminded us of, um, uh, of, of an old theory of consciousness um, by Penfield and Jasper, two neurologists uh, from the eastern seaboard of the US uh, near here, um, who recognized in their epileptic uh, patients, their adult epileptic patients, that there, that there remained a high degree of residual consciousness even when they took the cortex offline uh, during their, uh, during their surg surgeries. Uh, the, Bjorn Merker, a neurologist from uh, Uppsala in Sweden, uh, wrote a very important paper on this uh, called uh, Consciousness Without a Cerebral Cortex, a Challenge to Medicine uh, and Neuroscience. And he made the point that even anencephalic children and hydroencephalic children, these are children born without cerebral cortices, uh, have a high degree of consciousness. They can act with their own sense of agency uh, to engage in the world with purpose and generate emotional and affective relationships with others. Um, so it begs uh, the question of why we focus so much time on the cerebral cortex. Um, this is the, the brainstem itself with some midbrain structures. Um, you can see that in, the, in the, the, the solid rendering and the cerebral cortex uh, is faded out. And you can see that this is in the center of the encephalon, the center of the skull, the center of the head. And thus their, their theory uh, of the centroencephalic um, center of consciousness. Um, this is a hydroencephalic child from a textbook example on the left-hand side. Uh, and this is a uh, hydroencephalic child, a three-year-old um, girl here with her baby brother, uh, engaging in uh, a meaningful and important social relationship uh, with her parents. Uh, and, and it begs the question um, why we spend so much time focusing on the activities of the cerebral cortex when, in fact, that, that, that core agentive center um, is subcortical. Um, a cortex we now recognize is not necessary to be conscious, uh, to have feelings, to act with basic intentions, to perceive and appraise the environment, and to engage socially and purposefully with others, and to learn. And this is corroborated by surgically decerebrated cat and rat experiments, which used to be the domain of, uh, of uh, uh, neuroanatomists in medical schools, where they would cut the cerebral cortex off of a cat or off of a rat uh, in neurosurgery, uh, so suture up um, the cranium and the, uh, and the derma and the, and the head, uh, let it heal, and those animals could still locomote. They could engage and navigate complex, uh, complex terrain. They could perform elaborate courtship rituals. They could copulate and wean litters, all without a cerebral cortex. So why we spend so much time uh, on the cerebral cortex uh, is, is a question that has to be asked, and I think we should look deeper into the brain uh, into the brainstem functions, uh, and not only its um, neurophysiology, but its neuropsychology as well. W from Miaf Pangsep's work, we now recognize that this brainstem is what we would call uh, the center of uh, primary consciousness to differentiate it from our higher levels. It's the foundation uh, of uh, what uh, Yang Sep, uh, Yak Pangsep identified as the core self, and what we might uh, relate uh, to Winnicott's idea uh, of, the, of the core self. It's affective, it's evaluative, it's prospective, there's an anticipatory awareness um, that's, uh, that's uh, mediated by the brainstem. It's a preconceptual conscious experience uh, and pre-reflective, but the, nevertheless, it is conscious. It's what the philosophers might call phenomenal consciousness or direct consciousness. Um, it has direct neural access to all the senses, visual perception, uh, auditory perception, touch uh, and smell and so on. Um, as well as the interoceptive organs, so the, the, the body state, uh, and the body in movement, uh, is proprioception. The experiences of this basic brainstem-mediated primary self um, then become stored uh, in, in memories uh, through, the secondary, uh, through the secondary systems, the secondary consciousness, uh, which is able to store simple memories and plans. Uh, and importantly, these then become shunted up into the cerebral cortex to become reorganized and re-remembered uh, in, in new concepts and ideas uh, for more sophisticated offline plans to emerge so that actions in the present moment can be coordinated uh, to achieve goals and ends that are not immediately in sight because they're abstract. Right. Uh, this is um, taken straight from Jak Pangsep, um, Pangsep's paper. Um, he, he developed a very beautiful paper with Mark Soms called um, The Id Knows More Than the Ego Admits 
where they present this nested view uh, of the brainstem mediated primary process consciousness here, which gets nested into the limbic system um, and then gets that limbic and primary system gets nested into this higher tertiary cortical system uh, and this feed forward and feedback regulation, up and down regulation uh, between all three. But of course, our immediate experience cuts across all three layers and works synchronously and coherently across all three uh, dimensions so that we have one unified moment of experience. And when I come to the autism part of this, this is where we think uh, something is going uh, differently awry in, in the case of autism. If we relate it back to Freud's idea of the old id uh, and the ego, where the id was unconscious, uh, we now recognize that to, in fact, uh, have a lot more conscious activity and, and its basic structure to be consciousness, uh, conscious itself before the ego, the superego, and so forth uh, come into being. If we look at this purely from a sensory motor perspective, um, the simple acts, reaching to grasp, reaching to touch, for example, if I reach to grab uh, the bottle of water, that's a primary uh, action, reach to touch. There's, there's a prospect of organization, a basic intention, uh, and at sensory consequences, I can then bridge those into sequences, reach, grasp, lift, tilt, and so forth to drink some water. Uh, and of course, as we become more sophisticated and uh, more uh, abstract in our in our ideas, we can start to perform elaborate uh, rituals such as cooking dinner, having a dinner party, inviting friends over at a certain time, creating um, the uh, the the kitchen and the dining table, all through simple sequences of acts to produce small projects which become nested in other projects. So the question is, well, how does this begin in in very early uh, life? This is a newborn baby. Um, coordinating simple sensory motor acts to latch onto the breast um, for, uh, for uh, nutrition, of course. The baby has to coordinate uh, his or her intentions with the mother. The eye gaze, of course, is aligning arousal, interest, uh, and intentions to be able to produce a project uh, through the scaffolding, through the, uh, the assistance of the mother, so that the project can be completed and satisfaction can ensue. Right? Satisfaction, in this case, uh, on both sides. So these simple sensory motor acts um, develop and become more sophisticated, but are always shared with others. Yay, bravo, Juliet, bravo. So again, very simple acts. One foot forward, primary intentions. One foot forward, one foot forward, one foot forward to produce a project of these chained actions which generate deep satisfaction and, and in this case, joy to be shared uh, with her father. So these are the two principles. I like to move and I like to move it uh, with you. And through these, we move through these primary, through secondary, and then this huge elaboration uh, of tertiary, tertiary consciousness, tertiary mental processes, uh, which is the domain and the focus of cognitive neuroscience. So we're now understanding in terms of autism and in terms of this model within autism, um, there's a disruption to this primary mode of experience, right? This primary level, this primary process, deeply subcortical uh, processing that is occurring uh, in, in aut autism spectrum disorder. And that's disrupting the cohesion of the the levels uh, above it, the secondary and the tertiary levels. Uh, this, is, comes, this originally comes from work uh, with Penelope Dunbar, uh, a very talented uh, autistic colleague. Um, we worked together uh, over a period of about five years uh, in uh, interviews of about an hour uh, over uh, each, each month. Um, and we reflected on her particular experiences. She's also a philosopher uh, and a neuroscientist, well, and, and a lay neuroscientist, I should say, more of a neuroscience scholar. And we came to an understanding of her personal experience of a disruption to her, her motor self and her abstract reflective capacity to understand that. Uh, and she made uh, you know, very uh, many astute observations, uh, one of which was just quite telling, that she, for example, found herself uh, on the floor of the street at one point, um, and she did not know why. And she had to cast her mind back to understand that, yes, she had been walking and hit her head uh, on the lamppost, and the lamppost uh, pushed her down and she was on the floor. So there was a disengagement between her abstract, uh, conceptually back tertiary level of awareness uh, and her immediate primary level of, of sensory motor awareness. Uh, the two were disconnected. There was a lack of cohesion between the two. 
Um, so this brainstem disruption of the core self um, comes to us from several points of evidence. One is the first person perspective, and I'm sure that you can reflect on many similar yourselves. Uh, the second uh, position is from motor control science itself. We now recognize that there's a fundamental, a subtle but significant difference in the way that prospective movements are organized uh, in autistic individuals. So this motor control fundamentals, as we have been looking at, are predicated on a cohesive and efficient brainstem integrative system. We also have uh, beautiful evidence from the acoustic brainstem response latencies, uh, which uh, Liz Torres has produced the latest evidence for, uh, and that's on the, at the back of a very small but very important uh, group of papers uh, that show this to be the case. And of course, neuroanatomy, because the brainstem function uh, is dependent on its anatomical uh, cohesion. So I'll just run through these quickly um, and, uh, and make sense of that before wrapping up. Uh, just another point uh, from Penelope Dunbar, uh, she, in her reflection on her autistic uh, experiences, uh, she learned to co-opt her autistic tendencies uh, for repetition and her, um, and her difficulty in transitions uh, into healthy routines uh, of behavior, healthy lifestyle routines. Uh, one is swimming, because swimming is a repetitive activity that produces a consistency of sensations, um, which uh, gave her body not only the physical um, the physical health uh, that it needed, but also enabled her to free her mind to think more abstractly together in concert with the rhythms that her body was producing swimming. So if you think of swimming as one arm forward and the legs kicking, these are beautifully rhythmic movements. And of course, through the, through the, uh, the friction, the, the frictionless medium of the water, but it doesn't change until you get to the end. But of course, the lanes themselves then become rhythmic uh, in themselves. Uh, and this allowed her uh, to, to develop a great sense of calm uh, and also a, a cohesion between her mind and her body. Uh, and similarly with collage, uh, she would work on collage for hours and she became a very accomplished collage artist, um, cutting, pasting, uh, and cutting and pasting in this rhythmic manner uh, over many minutes, many hours. But at the same time, while her body was working, her mind was free to reflect uh, in its own time with the actions of its body so she could see the symbolisms of the pieces of collage that she was producing. In terms of the motor control, um, we know that the prospect of organization uh, is, is disrupted. Uh, Liz Torres has produced some very beautiful work on this. Uh, in our own work on iPad serious games, the, the, the kids um, play a, a, an iPad game where they're dragging pieces of food to the plates. And from these kinds of data, we can determine uh, that the movements themselves are different in, the auto in, in autism as they are from, uh, from neurotypicals. Uh, in, there's a greater velocity, a difference in the time of the peak velocity, uh, and a difference in, in that composition, which begin to teach us about feedforward and feedback mechanisms that are disrupted uh, in, in, the, in the autistic motor system. Um, we can also use those movements using serious games and the computational analysis of those movements uh, to be able to detect autism early um, using a simple iPad game that lasts about 10 to 15 minutes. The play patterns are distinctively different. And of course, the iPad itself um, is, a, is a highly sensorized device. You have the, the touch screen and you have the, the IMU sensor inside. And we can use those signals and machine learning algorithms to be able to identify autism uh, in children from two and a half to about six years of age uh, with a very high degree of accuracy. And we're just concluding uh, a phase three diagnostic trial of about 760 children between the Gilberg Center uh, and, and my team in Glasgow. I think one of the most um, uh, informative studies was by Jen Cook um, in 2013. And she looked at the movements of simple actions of the arm swing moving back and forth uh, like this. These are now 40 year old adults. Um, and she just asked them to swing their arm first to a tempo uh, and then she recorded the displacement of those, uh, of those arm swings. By eye, those movements would not look dissimilar between the autism uh, and the control group. But if you look at the, um, the spatiotemporal characteristics, they have a greater peak velocity, a commensurate peak acceleration, but importantly also a higher amplitude jerk. This, now this jerk is happening at, at about seven to 13 hertz. Um, it's, a, uh, it's the rate of change of acceleration. So this higher amplitude jerk is effectively showing that the, the movements, even though they appear to be fluid, are in fact being adjusted continuously very quickly. 
So it's a bit like driving with your one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator and trying to drive smoothly. You might, the car might appear to be driving smoothly, but if you're oscillating between brake and accelerator, you're, you're wearing the engine and, and decreasing the efficiency of the system. You're, you're increasing the neural load uh, on, the, uh, on the neuromotor system. Uh, and the, the final piece of very important evidence here is um, from uh, Ajahn Bhatt, um, who did a, an important study of the Spark database of almost 12,000 individuals. Uh, and she found that, in fact, in all of those autistic uh, cases, in 87% of, of those uh, cases, um, those children could be diagnosed or considered at risk for developmental coordination disorder. So this is a very important piece of evidence um, that shows that, in fact, the motor component uh, uh, is, is very strongly associated uh, with autism, this, this primary um, movement disruption. Uh, this is the, um, the uh, ABR work from, from Liz Torres and, and others. And I'll just very quickly uh, look at some brainstem uh, neuroimaging studies that we've performed and then wrap up. Um, in a study of 76 uh, children with ASD and TD, we can look at the brainstem morphology. Uh, and from the morphology, we see significant differences and also significant volumetric differences. So the, the size and the shape of the brainstems are different. If we compare those um, with uh, developmental coordination disorder, uh, we see that the, the connectivity of the brainstem, especially with the cerebellum, uh, is significantly different. And it's different between uh, DCD and ASD, and it's different between uh, TD and ASD itself. Um, underpinning all of this, I think, is the inferior olive, which is a, it's a sensory motor pacemaker nucleus, um, which we only know from post-mortem tissue samples that there's a disruption to that pacemaking system, which coordinates and integrates uh, the sensory information with the motor uh, coordination, the motor output, uh, to produce a, a cohesion of sensing and moving purposefully in the world. Uh, and we've just begun a seven Tesla MRI study to try to characterize that better. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I think, I hope I've shown you that there is uh, a great degree of evidence to show that the brainstem uh, is actually a seat of psychological function, of subjective experience, of indeed a primary conscious experience that the brainstem from different lines of evidence uh, now becoming increasingly clear uh, is different in the case of autism. Um, so that basic sense of self in the world uh, and engaging that world purposefully uh, is, dis is different or disrupted uh, in the case of autism. And the communication therefore between those levels, that primary experience then being nested into memories and being then nested into an abstract understanding of the world and fed back into the world of narrative experience of moving in the world through time purposefully uh, and agentively with others uh, is different. And we need to understand this better, but this is only the beginning uh, of understanding how that can be put together in a, in a sensible way. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. That was wonderful.